My name is Sheila Siemens. I'm the director. Um, it's nice to see most of you. I mean, it's nice to see everybody, but um, a lot of your faces I recognize, but those that I don't, welcome to the Noyo Center's science series. Um, this is a, this, this talk in particular is one that's been a few years in the making. Um, I, I, I'm so excited about um, listening to Larry's talk and I hope all of you are aware that he has, he and, um, well, so I wanna welcome first both Mary and Larry Foster, an incredible duo that lives here in our community. They're not only are they a local treasure, but but they're a national treasure. I mean, the amount of um, Thanks. what Larry has added to the the science of cetacea, especially whales and pinnipeds, is is you know you can't overstate it. And so, having uh, the first time I met these two, who are just the kindest people you could meet, um, I, I was just sort of blown away by not only the depth of Larry's. 60 whatever year career um but the the the, the modesty and the humility that he, that he sort of reveals some of these things to you when you're talking to him so i mean larry's been in you know national geographic and smithsonian and sierra club you know and was the go-to artist for for decades with all of the um with all of the nature guides and was one of the few people that really learned, really taught us what whales and, and pinnipeds look like. And you know, we're kind of we're kind of spoiled now with these incredible underwater photograph uh, photo uh, video and, and photographs. But really the more I look at that stuff, the more impressed I am with what Larry was able to accomplish in all of his years without any of that. Um, and, and you know, so far, you're fairly accurate, Larry, <laughs> on everything that you've done. So, I mean, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's more than kind of incredible. It's, it's, it's really incredible. So um, if you aren't aware, I don't know why I shouldn't have my little thing on, but well, Larry has a book called that they did, Larry and Mary both put out this book called The Art of Discovering Whales. And not only is it an incredible, um, chronology of Larry's career, but it's just some really great storytelling about how he came upon doing this. So I highly recommend it. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. You could buy it in our store, which I would highly recommend over Amazon um, down on, at the Discovery Center. But um, it's it's absolutely a career. It's a career. It's a career that's worth reading. And, and um, I encourage you to do that. So with that, I will introduce Mr. Larry Foster, who is <coughs> here with us from Fort Bragg. Hey, Larry. That's you. Oh, is that me? Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much. We love the Noyo Center. Uh, we being um, Mary Foster, my Hi, sweet everybody. little wife. <laughs> and our little dog, Jack. He's a poodle. He's down there, Jack Foster, and myself. Now, um, we've put together a series of slides. How many? I would say um, about 45 minutes worth. And I do have two captions I would like to read. And here's the first caption right here. Whale Terror at Sea, 14th century Flemish woodcut, LF felt pen. Now, Mary and I both like that caption because we like the combination and juxtaposition of 14th, 14th century felt pen. Sort of <laughs> nice. But the point is, the point is, whales have always been treated terribly throughout history. Um, here's some, some of the things I grew up with. This is a, up in the upper left, that's a gray whale. Overinflated, I would say about 17,000 PSI. Same with the humpback below. This artist added um, an eyebrow to give the uh, attitude to the humpback. Drawings on the right. These are uh, people that tried hard to do whales, uh, I guess. They made the whole thing up, I'll say. Um, but the point is, if I, was, if, I, if I were doing birds, I would definitely look at Audubon. But if you're doing whales, there is no Audubon. Here's a person that did a nice 
job with the, the, the clouds in the upper left and the guys were in the boat and the boats on the water all very nice but what about that whale who came up with that we call that the Goodyear whale <laughs> uh, life magazine 1945 right maybe it says right there uh, this person made up a whole lot of things because see that bump on the top of the head and look at that protuberance on the lower lip right in front of the eye that's pure invention in lieu of research no way has anything like that. But artists perpetuated each other's errors over the over the years. And there are some examples of this protuberance on the lower lip to the right. And this occurred over and over and over. I put a few examples here just to show that you couldn't really um, you couldn't really uh, rely on on other artists. Now, if I can show you a real blue whale, this is a this is a face of a blue whale on a whaling deck. Look how streamlined and beautiful and sweet it is. There's a lump on the top of the head and there's no lump on the lip. It's a beautiful streamlined Corvette. Goes through the water, uh, goes through the water uh, like, a, like no friction at all. Notice a nice little eye. Now this is the largest whale, the largest animal and the largest rock wolf. Oh, rock wolf. Long, thin, streamlined whales that have uh, pleats on the bottom to allow for expansion when they gulp water, when, when they bite water. Now this photograph shows some of those plates on the bottom. This is the same photograph. These photographs were published in 1904. And so this information has been there for a long time. This whale showed me one thing along with lots of other photographs of carcasses that I have. I spent years collecting them. And it shows the whale long and thin, not at all, over PSI or blown up or anything like that. So I started painting whales as soon as I got the nerve to try uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I made them long and thin too. Show the blue whale, Mary. Here, here's that painting I did of a blue whale. Uh, it's sort of close, but the idea is to make the whale look good, make it uh, sort of anatomically correct. Well, very anatomically correct. And um, and it's a pleasure to bring the whales to life. Now, about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, something like that, Mary said, Larry, we have your photographs of your paintings and your drawings and your sculptures all over the house. Why don't we put them all together in a nice catalog or maybe a, maybe a book? So five years, four years ago, we decided to get serious and we actually did this book. And here's the book, The Art of Discovering Whales. Larry Foster, whale artist. Now you see my big fat name on the cover. Let me tell you a little something about this. This was Mary's idea. She laid it out, she designed it, she produced it, <laughs> she published it, uh, and I get all the credit. No, not all the credit, Mary, but uh, anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fun to see, um, see that nice book come out. Uh, here's another cast I'd like to read. This is a drawing I did in 19, one of my first whales, I guess, 1939. Uh, Crayon, you know, Crayola in, in Sacramento, California. And here's the other caption I wanted to read. The principal said it was the finest, most praiseworthy example of marine mammal artwork he had ever seen in the history of the kindergarten at Newton Booth Elementary School. <laughs> so that's another caption we enjoyed writing. But I really did see a whale uh, in the early 40s we were in the, the train station in Sacramento and we all went down and looked at it. And guess what we saw? Nothing. Didn't make a bit of sense. We stood there and looked at it. It was like a big wall of naugahyde or something. I, I really uh, don't know. But I grew up wanting to do sculptures of whales. In the 60s, I found myself teaching school, but also as a little profitable hobby, I was making stained glass lampshades very decorative and very uh, exciting and beautiful. I decided to do a stained glass lampshade in the shape of a whale, a blue whale. I didn't do any research. Um, I didn't know about research. I went to Scientific American, got this drawing out of the 1956 issue. I figured that would be pretty accurate. It's uh, in the Scientific American. And so I blew this little drawing, this little sketch here uh, up on the wall nine feet long. And I made my wheel from that. However, halfway through it, I realized I had too much, too much glass, not enough whale. 
Um, whale anatomy took a back seat on this one. And I did one more stained glass whale. Always the same thing, too much glass, not enough whale. This is a life-size sperm whale calf. Uh, very uh, unrewarding. Uh, yes, yeah, 12 feet long. And looking into, into the mouth, show the other for Here it is. Um, here it is in Potpourri Gallery in Berkeley, California. And it's pretty impressive up on the wall and it's a nice stained glass lampshade. It's beautiful, 12 feet long, hangs up there, beautiful thing. People come around to see it. However, uh, it's an insult to sperm whales. I realized right halfway through this one here, I was barking up the wrong tree and I realized I was gonna go to the library and do some research. So I did. And I spent what, three or four years in the library photographing carcasses. Cause when you go to the library and look up whales, it's not just whales, it's whales and whaling. The whale is the only animal to have its picture on a postcard as a carcass. You look up whales and whaling and you come across all of these whaling photographs, uh, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of them. And I was able to reconstruct some of these carcasses. I put them back together. This blue whale on top shows relationship of people and whale. And also it's a very pristine drawing, five feet long pencil. Uh, I some idea what the whale would look like for myself and for other people. So here's this very pristine dead, dead, um, that blue whale. Here's a right whale. In the 60s, I had a very little knowledge of right whale anatomy. Uh, the man, his hat is right below the whale's eye. The whale is on, it's a right whale, it's on its right side. Uh, the girl is standing on the whale's rostrum, the top of the mouth. Behind her legs, you can see the baleen. And you can see that giant lo lower lip. Now, baleen and these slow moving filter feeders they, um, the baleen can be 12 feet long, 14, 15 feet long. And that long, big lower lip, the size of your garage door, uh, grows up to protect the baleen. That's why they have that, uh, that um, strange shape. My first humpback, my first humpback was um, a carcass. That's what I was looking at and that's what I was doing. And I used pencil for all these drawings. I used pencil because I believe it's the most austere medium. It doesn't dry, there's no water, there's no oil. All there is is graphite on the surface. So you don't get carried away with technique, you stick to the topic. And that's what, uh, that's what we were trying, trying to do. The top is another pencil drawing, it's five or six feet long again. Uh, not at all accurate, but I didn't know that at the time. Well, I knew I wasn't too close because I put those figures on there from a Thomas Aikens painting jumping off the nose. But I did get the nerve to try and reconstruct uh, a, a, a fin whale in the lower left. The animal, um, they reach about 80 feet, 80 feet, Mary, not 70 feet, something like that. And I, I, I'm reconstructing this fin whale here from all these photographs. It's a little bit like you wanna, do a picture of a 49 Studebaker Land Cruiser. Having never seen one, the only thing you have to look at are photographs of accidents taken by the highway patrol. That's exactly what this is. It's a very interesting project. Now, I met a lot of scientists and they were also wonderful to help me. I'm talking back in the 60s and 70s, 80s. Gordon Williamson, he lived in Scotland, very well-known marine biologist. He loved eels. There he is on the right. But he also loved whales and he did an amazing, amazing, almost frightening thing. He persuaded a Japanese whaling company to shoot their whales with non-exploding harpoons so the whales wouldn't die immediately and be blown all apart. So that he could actually dive into the water next to these poor doomed whales still trying to swim to document their, docu document their true body shapes underwater. And he did, and he published his results. And I was totally impressed. I couldn't believe he would do it. So I sent him some of my photographs, the photographs of some of my drawings of carcasses. They were sort of scholarly and he was very impressed. So you know what he did? He sent me all of his photographs that he took underwater. And he made me minky whale relevant. I didn't know if minky whale photographs to do this, this study on the left.
the top three individuals are northern Mickey whales. You can tell it's northern Mickey whales because the Mickey whale is the only rorqual, you know, long, thin, streamlined with pleats on the, uh, about a white patch on, on the flipper. Only the Mickey whale has a white patch on the flipper. The two bottom ones are southern variations, uh, different pigmentation variations. Yeah. So Gordon uh, was very impressed with what I did because I sent this copy of it. I sent a copy of this study to him. He photographed it and sent it all over the northern hemisphere. So all of a sudden, I had a hidden record. It was like Mickey whale relevant. Fun thing. This shows my fear of making the whales too uh, too overweight. I made them. I frequently made them too thin. But I'll say one thing about this. This is a blue whale pencil drawing. The original drawing is about 10 feet long. It takes up a whole wall here in our house. But that's a beautiful uh, picture of the, the flipper of a, of a blue whale. Very streamlined and also swept back. White margins. Very nice. Beautiful thing. We always try to get whales in high places. And I love whale flukes. So when I was asked to do a, a gray whale brochure for the American Cetacean Society years, years ago, I put the flukes right on the cover. And I got the idea, wouldn't it be nice to do a full size, life size sculpture of a gray whale? You could get a really good look at those flukes then, you could stand right on top of them. So uh, I did a drawing sh showing my intentions. I wanted to do this life size sculpture. Ted Walker produced a beautiful little book, Whale Primer, Whale Primer. And lots and lots of photographs of gray whales because he lived in Scammers Lagoon for many years and studied gray whales. He had lots of photographs. So I sent him this drawing I did of the sculpt, I, uh, showing my intentions to do a sculpture. And he was very impressed and he called me up. He said, hello, uh, I would like to talk to whale man Larry Foster. This is Ted Walker speaking. And I was very impressed. He actually called me up. He invited me to his house in La Jolla. I went down there. We spent most of the night talking about gray whales. I invited him to come to my studio. He did. And he brought me, he brought me about three carousels of gray whale pictures. Very well photographs that he had taken in Scammon Lagoon, you know, in Baja, California. I actually had enough. Yeah, I invited to come to my studio. He brought me the stuff. I made him a tuna sandwich and we had some nice ice water. Uh, I, um, I actually did because of Ted Walker. I was able to lay out a life-size sculpture of a gray whale. Here it is. In the middle, you can see the armature. To the left, there I am on top of the whale with now covered with chicken wire to be saturated with cement. It's actually concrete, we call it cement. And my right foot is on the whale's left flipper. Even at this stage, you can see the phalanges because whales are, you know, evolved from terrestrial animals. On the right is those beautiful, those beautiful flukes. Valerie Cross on top, Jack Sims, amazing whale people, both of them, and myself, and we're getting ready to saturate this with the uh, cement. There the whale is finished on, uh, on the bottom. The whale left this, uh, yeah, the whale's name was Sandy because the warehouse got pretty sandy when we were making it, so we called the whale Old Sandy. Well, Old Sandy's first, um, first appointment with the public was at, uh, at uh, the, Caltech, Caltech. yeah, Cal, uh, Cal Poly uh, in uh, Pasadena. Yeah. And everyone, everyone thought it was perfectly logical to have a sculpture of a life-size whale right there on the campus. There it is on the right. Uh, but someone said, why would you want a sculpture of a dead whale? Why would you want that? And I said, well, Ted Walker assured me, gray whales are designed to strand or get hung up in shallow water and they can wait for the next tide. And they do, because they live in places where there's shallow water. I don't like to use the word strand, uh, that's a little different topic. But they do get hung up, and Ted, saw, Ted said he saw uh, several times whales hung up, wait for the tide to refloat them, and then swim away. Quite a, quite a nice, beautiful thing. So the whale traveled from there, the whale traveled all, all over the United States. Here it is in Fremont, California, Sandy the whale in Fremont, California. Every time the whole made, a, of an appearance somewhere, 
we would mail out flyers to marine centers and schools and museums, anyone that would like to come and talk about whales. Uh, I got to know these ducks pretty well. This is in Fremont, California, uh, right next to Oakland where the whale was constructed. And one little more thing about this photograph, that's my cute little Porsche in the background. I drove it for 35 years, no squeaks, no rattles. But eventually the whale came back to California. Well, let's talk about this here first. Yeah, the Franklin Institute, this is an example of a show. I had about uh, 40 or 50 paintings and drawings and sculptures at the Franklin Institute, and including Sandy the whale. And the director said, Larry, we've been sort of keeping track and we believe close to a million people have climbed on your whale since it's been here. I said, wow, we must be doing something right. He said, yes, we certainly are. Uh, these examples of posters on the bottom show places where the whale appeared all over the place. I did want to mention Boston's Museum of Science. That took two, two trucks, two large semis to deliver the, all the paintings and sculptures. But what a beautiful museum and what beautiful people and what a wonderful thing to go there and, 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 and uh, have the show at, the, at Boston's Museum of Science. So the whale came back to California and ended up at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History in Pacific Grove, California. Uh, one of my favorite museums for sure. My father called me up. You might wonder, well, how did the museum take possession of the whale? My father called me up, said, Larry, I just bought three pounds of your whale. I just bought three pounds of Sandy. And I said, yeah, what do you mean by that? I'm waiting for the next uh, joke. He said, no. In Pacific Grove, they're selling your whale by the pound. I bought three pounds. They sent me a certificate. I had it framed and showed it to all my friends. They also sent me little bumper stickers and lapel pens and a bunch of stuff like that. Well, the people in Pacific Grove had a pretty massive public campaign mm -hmm. to sell the whale, and they raised thousands of dollars and installed the whale. It was um, quite a beautiful thing. Now. I want to talk to Sheila about this, Mary. Show that. Here's the model. If you have the model for a whale or anything, uh, the rest of it's easy. Anyone can be, build a whale if you have an accurate, anatomically accurate sculpture. This is a 40 foot plaster sculpture cut up like a loaf of bread, and the pieces are enlarged, and the whale is made from that. Now, I was going to say something to Sheila. I was going to say, you know, Sheila, I have all these dimensions, and I still have this model. Sometime uh, way in the future, we can make a 46 foot. <laughs> She's a thumbing up. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we can make a 46, 46 foot gray whale, ferro cement. It wouldn't be that expensive because we don't have to move it. It could be permanently mounted somewhere. So one day we'll, one day maybe we'll talk about that. You name the day, Larry. You name the day. <laughs> you name the date, she said. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, what are you doing a little later? No. <laughs> anyway, let's digress in the National Whale Symposium uh, in um, Bloomington, Indiana in 1975. A beautiful, beautiful place. I had a great show there, had the whale there. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And some people from the National Geographic came, including the art director. And they went around and looked at all my paintings and drawings, and they looked at me. And they said they didn't want me to they wanted to know if I wanted to go to lunch. I said, Well, does a goose go barefoot? Yes, I want to go to lunch. So we went to lunch and they wanted me to do a chart for the magazine showing my discoveries of sitting there in the library photographing these whale carcasses for all those many months. So I did the chart for them, and here it is. Once again, it shows my fear of making the animals too thin. I mean, too fat. I made them look too thin. Yeah, that gray whale is way too thin. And the humpback, a little thin too, but they like they like the chart, and they printed uh, 12. twelve million of them. So all of a sudden, I had another hit in the record. Pretty nice. I had my own chart though, because I was being published in magazines and, and nature uh, catalogs and, and and here and there. I did my own whale chart because I had an education packet that I would send out to schools when they contacted me. I, uh, I put in the lower right hand corner, okay to reproduce. This is a 35, this is a, a eight and a half by 11 little chart that I did. Probably the first carefully researched chart ever done for schools of whales. And I had people actually call me up and thank me that they could reproduce the chart. Now, these drawings 
are from a whole panel I had. It must have been about 14 feet long on the well, on the wall. One inch equals a foot. So the blue whale at the bottom, uh, 90 inches, uh, represents a 90 foot blue whale. I'll say one thing about these drawings, massive research took me forever, but I wanted to see what the total order looked like. Um, the drawings are not ink, they're not paint, they're not pencil. You know what they are? They're chart tape, one eighth inch chart tape. Sharp is very nice because it makes very consistent line work, keeps the personality out of the line, and also it's easy to change, make little corrections. One more thing I want to mention in the upper right hand corner, if you look at the total group, the upper right hand corner, those are beak whales. Uh, mysterious, uh, elusive, rare, um, and intriguing to me. I I'd like to say a few more words about beak. See how big that group is? A lot of them. I would uh, like to say a few more words about beak whales, but uh, let's go on with the charts for a minute. Here's a chart that uh, I did for National Geographic. It shows how little I knew about paint. The whales themselves are very good, I, I would say, but um, the background, should, I painted it too dark. I should have left it lighter colored. Okay, that's enough of that. I just want to point out a dolphin is an animal that reaches uh, anywhere from uh, six feet to 10 feet, uh, whatever, because Killer whales reach 30 feet, and a killer whale is nothing but a big dolphin, not nothing, but a killer whale is a big dolphin. Here's another, here's another chart I did. Uh, Pacific Financial Companies Insurance, you know, Power of the Pacific, they called me. They wanted me to do a chart for their, um, their people. And I said, well, I got a good idea. Why don't we do a chart showing just the baleen whales? No killer whales, no sperm whales, just the baleen whales. That'd be fun to see. 10 species. So I did the chart and they loved it. They sent me a thousand of them. Beautiful thing. There's the original artwork on the right. There I am uh, with a 30 by 40 illustration board, a transparent watercolor uh, on, uh, on the board. That shows that. Now here's the chart that Mary and I did together for Noah. She did the bottom, all the mechanics showing a, no matter where you are, you can call up and report a stranded animal. And I did the drawings of the whales, uh, even the turtle. First time I ever did a turtle, but you know, I like turtles a lot. They're really nice animals. The people from the pond called me up across the pond and they wanted me to illustrate the whales that are swimming around uh, the British Isles. Yeah, BBC Wildlife Magazine. So this is the chart I did for them. This is a, sort of a nice chart, yeah. And here's the last chart I did for the National Geographic before they changed uh, art directors. At this point, I'm getting pretty good at the anatomy. That humpback whale on the right is pretty close. Not a bad humpback whale at all. Blue whale's pretty good. Now those whales are pretty nice. However, on the left, that's the first time I ever had to paint fur. And I didn't really like it too much. But Mary and I got a taste of um, paleontology, uh, extinct species of whales. And the National Geographic wanted me to do it. one more little page showing the evolution of nose to a blowhole. So on the right, you can see these examples, the top four fossils showing the migration of the nose. The bottom is not a fossil, that's a modern bottlenose dolphin. The chart on the left is typical. It shows a terrestrial animal, you know, typical in whale evolution. A terrestrial animal on top that liked to splash around, finally entered the water, and they had a paddle-shaped tail, we believe, that went up and down and four feet. Then the Doridontine down below, the hind legs are gone and it has flukes. And then below, that's the Squalodon. They were around for millions of years. And then finally, the, the modern dolphin uh, flipper, you know, bottlenose dolphin. The best time we had during these little uh, paleontology uh, assignments was to go to LA County Museum in Los Angeles and see my good friend, Dr. Lawrence Barnes. He is a man that knows some stuff about fossil whales. We spent several days down there and it was a wonderful experience. He would describe, he would describe uh, and show us the fossils. Mary photographed a lot of them. And I would do ballpoint pen drawings based on the guesswork uh, and what we could see in the, in the, the fossils. Here's another page. Um, 
the Bacillosaurus is about 40 feet long. It's pretty well known, even with little hind feet, uh, hind legs. However, I think contemporary recreations of all this work would be better. You know why? Because be, it would be based on more current and more modern guesswork. Now, here's some books I was happy to be in. And in the middle, the Sierra Club Handbook of Whales and Dolphins, I had another hit and record. I think they reprinted that about 22 times, as I remember. It was around for a long time. I did about 80 paintings for the book. And Mary put together a collage showing some of these paintings. I worked on it for four or five years. Oh, boy, that was a sampling. Yeah, this is just a sampling of the, of the photographs. Now, the medium is tempera also known as gouache. What tempera is, is very fancy, highly refined, very expensive poster paint. Because when it dries, it dries. It doesn't cure, it's just water soluble and it's opaque. And when it dries, it dries matte. So when the work is photographed, and I sent work all over the world to be photographed, there will be no reflection and no glare and no shine to confuse the camera lens. Yeah, so uh, this this little collection is a nice little uh, uh, group of, uh, of uh, cetacea. However, my favorite whale is not here and that's the fin whale. Mary's got a, here's a photograph. Here's a photograph of a painting I did of a fin whale. Fin whales have the most striking example of pigment pigmentation asymmetry in the animal kingdom. The left side of the face is dark or black, but the right side of the face, the lower lip, is pure white. It's a beautiful, amazing thing. So I did this painting to show what it might look like underwater. And then my good friend and fellow whale worker, Jack Sims, he said, Larry, we could make a 50 foot fin whale in one piece out of fiberglass. It'd be a beautiful thing. We could move it easily, probably wouldn't weigh more than 1,200 pounds or so. And we could show that beautiful uh, lower right lip. So we did that. Um, the World Wildlife Fund, the panda in the middle, they helped us a lot. We couldn't have done it without the World Wildlife Fund. Fort Mason in San Francisco donated a warehouse for us the space. So that was nice. They're doing the, the space to us. Here the whale is finished and being helicoptered in San Francisco. That's Jam Jack Sims getting the whale down to the grass. Now, lower left hand corner, look at that beautiful white lower lip. Isn't that amazing? Sure is to me. Here's another photograph. The whale's name is Fina. I made up the name Fina because the Latin name Bellanoptera Bellanoptera fecilis doesn't really fly off the tongue that well. So I just I made up the name Fina, a very nice name. Now, one day we had to measure Fina. We didn't have a tape measure, but uh, the whale's 50 feet long, but we had to measure it anyway, so we used kids. We found out it takes about, how many kids? About, about 12 kids. Yeah, about 12 kids to accurately measure this uh, adolescent fin whale. Now, one thing, this is not very accurate. The kids vary so much in length. Here's the whale in her finally home. Fin of the whale in her finally home at the Lawrence Hall of Science, part of UC Berkeley. And uh, we're definitely uh, always inspired to get whales in high places. And this is in the Berkeley Hills. It really is in high places. And you can tell this photograph is taken early in the morning because nobody's climbing on the whale. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, getting whales in high places, and I love whale flukes. Here's a painting I did on a photograph. Two friends of mine are pretending to look at the, a beautiful whale sculpture. And there's a nice little ballpoint pen sketch in the lower left-hand corner. I just wanted to say something. Even if you don't know anything about whale anatomy, uh, it's important to know that these flukes, they're, they're not part of the skeletal structure. They're like human ears. That is pretty amazing to me. But even if you don't know any, anything about whale anatomy, you can look at those luscious succulent forms blending into each other. The intrinsic value of these shapes alone uh, generates aesthetic response. Uh, so we try to get whales in high places. I had a good idea for getting whales in high places. Back when the United States postage was eight cents, I proposed to the Bureau of Engraving. I got a good idea. Let's make a whale stamp, a blue whale stamp, 
let me have a little swallow of seawater. Ooh, salty. Anyway, um, and, I, and the Bureau of Engraving got to know me pretty well because I kept sending, sending them examples. So when, when postages were 25 cents, I sent them my most persuasive packet. And here they are. Now, the Bureau of Engraving, Bureau of Engraving actually did call me. And they said, Mr. Foster, we love your designs. We love your enthusiasm. We love your dedication. We would love to have a whale stamp. However, the subject matter of United States post stamps has nothing to do with the Bureau of Engraving. It's all done politically, therefore uh, unreliable and maybe circuitous. So um, I was hard, sorry to say there's no whales in high places on this one. However, the director told me that he was so impressed in the whole department like my work that they were going to send me a little token of appreciation in recognition of my zeal for disambiguating all these whales. And two weeks later, I got a check for $2,000 from the Bureau of Engraving. So I had tears of joy and tears of unjoy. No whales in high places on that one. Too bad that would have been fun. Now, the Bank of America, their, their headquarters in San Francisco, and I'm right across the bay in Alameda, they came to my studio. They wanted me to do whale checks for the bank, five, five different whale checks. So I did. Here they are. Now, I did a clever thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. The panes are 24 inches wide, long, 24 inches wide. So I took a Bank of America check to the photo lab and had five film positive, clear positives made of Bank of America checks. So I could impose that over the paintings to make sure there was no lines going through an eye, no lines, lines are mandatory, uh, parallel to a, a lip or bumping into a whale's nose or anything amateurish. I took the artwork with the overlays and registration marks to Bank America. They were so happy. They said, Larry, you've done all the work. Two weeks later, they called me up and said, Larry, we've done something we've never done with any other artist. We've put the artist's name in the lower right-hand corner of the check designs. Artist Larry Foster. Mary, can you show that? There it is. Look at that. So Bank of America was my bank. Uh, I immediately ordered eight boxes of checks. And every time I wrote a check, my name appeared on it three times. I thought, I thought that was highly evolved. But here's, here's the whales in high places. The Bank of America, from the proceeds from my check designs, donated thousands and thousands of dollars to the Marine Mammal Fund and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Whales in high places, that was a beautiful thing. I felt like I had a nice part in helping these two beautiful institutions. Whales in high places, how about whales playing poker? That might get whales in high places. Well, even those, those, are, you know, those are actually card sharks at the bottom. You can see the card sharks, little pink bellies. Anyway, um, whales playing poker, poker never uh, elevated whales to very high places. Certainly not as high as dogs playing poker or even cats playing canasta. But here's a better one. Whales in high places. How about whales on a coin? Humpback whale on a coin. Um, the most advanced zoological field person that I know is Ken Balcom lives up in Puget Sound. This man has studied some whales. He took this photograph back in the late 60s or 70s. No one knew what it was. He showed it to me. I said, now, Ken, what is happening here? Does this whale have its mouth open or is that a broken jaw or what are we looking at? He explained it to me and I did the drawing in the middle. I added the other flipper and brought the whale, brought the whale out of the water a little bit, a little bit more. And this drawing was on display at a UNESCO conference in Paris. Can you believe that? And people from Tom were there. They loved the drawing. They contacted me and asked if they could put it on a coin. I said, well, of course, I'd be so thrilled and pleased. And even to this day, they keep giving me credit for this. 
However, Ken Balcom took that amazing, iconic photograph in the upper left. We give all the credit to Ken Balcom. Portraits of whales. If you're going to do an animal's portrait or a person's portrait, you don't have to show the whole body. I wanted to have a show of portraits of whales. A blue whale could be on a 20-foot canvas, fin whale on an 18-foot canvas, and so on. Now, I actually did the painting on the right. That's a life-size minke whale and calf. The painting is, here's the painting. The painting is, high, is 10 feet high. And you can walk up and see exactly how your size compared to the size of a minke whale, the smallest rock wall. You know, a rock wall, long, thin, streamlined pleats on the, on the village. Uh, the ladder on the right has been modified and reinforced. So no reason to worry about that. Now, here's our last project oriented picture. Fort Mason, where, the, where Fiend of the Whale was built, they put out a, a, a request from people to, for suggestions how they might convert the building to something useful for, for uh, people that, uh, yeah, to use the space. Sure, yeah. So I designed the world's largest whale museum, and here it is. And that would have definitely put whales in high places. Okay, now we're going to skip back a little bit or turn around. Mary put together some paintings that just show the beauty and fun of whales, not uh, not 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 so much project. Here's the first one. These are this is uh, these are southern right whales. They reach about 50, 50 feet long or larger. And um, this is a right whale singles bar because there pretty are there are plenty of times when they get together and jam and have fun and socialize with each other. No, Roger Payne, what? You wanted to show us. Yeah, I wanted to show a side view, a top view, a uh, bottom view, and show, show some right whales. This is not too realistic because uh, the animal's that big, it would never be that clear in the water, I don't believe. Now, Roger Payne, Dr. Roger Payne, knows more about right whales than anybody else in the world. He studied them face to face in Patagonia for several years. Um, and he critiqued my right whale illustrations. He made me right well relevant. I have to thank Roger Payne for that. Let's get back to dolphins a little bit. I love dolphins. Here's my favorite dolphin, Fraser's dolphin. Nice little animal. Well, they're not too little. They reach about nine feet. Very streamlined, beautiful pigmentation. If you look at those little teeny flippers, that tells you one thing. When they're swimming, they're probably going about 17,000 miles an hour underwater. Here's some Stenellas, another type of dolphin. They're sweet, cute, dainty. Uh, everybody loves Stenellas. This is a nice little oil painting. Porpoises, you say. Yeah, we have porpoises, six species. I want to mention the whale in the upper left. That's the most endangered cetacean on the planet, or one of them. Uh, it's a vaquita. They live only in Baja, California, and they're severely endangered from mankind's activities, fishing nets and other, other uh, endeavors that people are doing down there. One good thing, there's several groups working hard to save the vaquita. That's a nice thing to know. Um, Mary put in some, uh, Mary made all this, these decisions on these slides, put in some narwhals, show some nice things about narwhals. Notice those coquettish little flippers. And the male narwhal with a long tusk, look at his flukes. No longer swept back, they take on a different shape, very individualistic. And that tusk, that's actually a tooth that grows out from the upper jaw through the lip. Here, here's another example of narwhals, the lower left, uh, swimming with belugas. They really are pure white. And they live only on the northern hemisphere, hemisphere, mostly around circumpolar seas and a little lower than that. Okay, now let's, let's get back to those beak whales I talked about. Very intriguing for me. I would, I would like to spend a long time doing lots of work on beak whales. This is bear's beak whale. They reach about 40 feet long, pretty good size. But I'll say one thing individualistic about bear's beak whale. And beak whales in general, they don't have notches in their tails. Maybe a little dent, but they don't have that beautiful notch that I like so much. Here's another beak whale. This is the Cuvier's beak whale. Now, if you look at that face of the mother, it doesn't look like any porpoise. It doesn't look like any dolphin. It doesn't look like any tooth whale. It doesn't look like any baleen whale. 
It's a beak wheel that's so individual and unique and strange. The little ballpoint pen drawing at the bottom simply, uh, simply shows scale. One more thing in beak wheels, there's a group of there's a group in beak wheels called the mesoplodons, mesoplodon. There's about 14, 15, 16 species. They're very rare, very elusive, very little known. Uh, and they're very strange animals, very intriguing to me. But I do want to mention the strap tooth whale. Mesoplodons have teeth that grow up from the lower jaw and above the beak. And they help establish a hierarchy, you know, pecking order, because they push and shove and scrape each other with these teeth. Now the strap tooth whale, these teeth, these mandibular teeth, really do grow up and over the rostrum to the point where the animal's ability to open its mouth, to me, seems restricted. However, they feed mostly on squid and squid are perfectly suckable. So the strange de dentition probably doesn't affect uh, too much about dinner time. One more thing, this is my own observation. I just made it up. But it seems to me these animals can push and shove and get really violent with each other uh, and not jeopardize their lower jaw because they can close their mouth tight and go ahead and uh, scrape away, so to speak. This, this is uh, not a beak whale, this is sperm whales. The largest tooth whale is a sperm whale. I was visiting my friends who study sperm whales at Woods Hole one year. And my, my friend Watson told me, you know, sperm whales sometimes sleep vertically in the water, you know, vertically, heads up or heads down, but still vertical. So I did a painting of that. And I took it to the National Geographic. They didn't like it. I didn't like it either. It didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense at all to see the whales in this position. What were they doing? What is this? What's going on? Is the water sideways? What's going on? So I did this painting, this painting, uh, relaxing sperm whales at the surface. And everybody liked that. Um, now, there are plenty of good photographs nowadays showing sperm whales sleeping vertically in the water. It's an amazing thing to see. I just love it. Donna Grosvenor wrote a nice little book, The Blue Whale, for the National Geographic Young, Young Explorer series. And here's an illustration from that book. I had to leave room for text in the middle. Here's a close up look of the face of a rorqual, you know, long, thin, streamlined uh, pleats on the, the belly. But it shows you the emotive stare looking right through you, so to speak. Uh, in marine mammal talk, this is like Mona Lisa's smile. I did this painting to show one unique thing about gray whales that dominates. Their nose sticks out further than their chin. You know, we all, in California, we all love uh, gray whales. Yeah, they have, uh, they're bent benthic feeders. They have baleen, but they feed on, on benthic uh, critters. Here's a painting I did for Mary. We love whale flukes. Mary does, I do. I do. And it's called Humpback Poetry in Motion in the Ocean. It's just fun. But usually I try to be more serious. I wanted to get the anatomy correct because I wanted to capture the very essence of the animal, show what they look like. I may have exaggerated the stare in this mother humpback here a little bit, but it pretty well captures a, a lot of things uh, about the whale. Okay, this is a breaching humpback whale. Why would anybody paint do an oil painting of a breaching humpback whale when there are thousands of beautiful photographs of this event. Well, because the artist can exaggerate things, including every little last mystic speck of sea spray. And I use French Impressionist water, you know, Claude Monet or somebody. And I made it look like when the whale hits the water, it's going to make a tremendous crash, which I believe is some kind of whale communication, like I am, I'm over here, what, what are you doing? So anyway, this is our last slide, uh, almost. <laughs> we finished our book. I turned 87. We got our boosters. Jack got groomed. He's now ready for any class A dog show in the country. So we have no deadlines, no sponsors, no supervisors, nobody tapping their feet or shaking their keys. Wonderful thing. So Mary said, Larry, we have time. Why don't you just do some uh, fooling around, do some dolphin doodles. Let's see what uh, Larry Foster does. So I said, you know, Mary, 
out in the garage, I have about four or five boxes of felt pens. That's right, Safeway markers. I think I'll get those and you just scratch around on paper. Uh, now, wash your eyes now, because these aren't works of art and they're very scratchy. They're just fun. Here's one felt pen. Here's another one. Trying to be on the lighter side. Show some dolphins and stuff. Here's another one. Here's the last uh, felt pen. Having mastered that medium, the medium of Safeway markers, I continued in the vein of lightheartedness and kept on doing transparent water, kept on doing water, transparent watercolors. Here's a, a transparent watercolor. Let me explain something. When I say transparent, when anybody says transparent watercolor, if you see white, that means you're seeing the paper through the, the paint because the paint is transparent. When you work with gouache, if you see, you know, tempera, if you see white, that's opaque paint on top. So different, two different ways of doing it. Now, I would like to mention one thing about this. See that nice little dolphin in the lower left-hand corner? That's pure Picasso. <laughs> anyway, um, here's some other uh, little transparent watercolors, little fun dolphin things, just, just doodling around. This is a dolphin chambery, and the dolphins are having a good time. And uh, here's another one of these. But people ask me, well, Larry, what, what are you working on now? What are you working on nowadays? Well, I, I started a, 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 a series of about 40 or 50 uh, little paintings called the Fluke Variations. I always wanted to do flukes, so now I was doing flukes all I wanted and do them any way I wanted. So Mary Schuler's first fluke. I didn't try and make them transparent. I, I just didn't know which one would be in front. These are, these are whales in love. Here's another flute painting. Very delicate and graceful. Here's another flute painting. And here's one I finished this morning. It's a flute painting. And this is, um, this is our very last slide. So I'm gonna to have to return it to Sheila. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I mentioned our dog two or three times. Mary, can we show that? picture of our dog. Some people would like to see a picture of our dog. Mary, can you show the picture of our dog? Oh, yeah. There he is, Jack Foster, Bowser of Champions. Isn't he a cutie? So anyway, so anyway, Sheila, I'll come back to you, but you know, uh, we we love Noyo Center. We're proud members. And uh, oh, I'll mention one thing, Wales Only Press at the bottom. If anybody would like to see more whale stuff by uh, Mary and myself, uh, you can look up whalesonlypress.com. So Sheila, thank you so much. And we had a really fun time talking to you people tonight. And if anybody has any questions, uh, we'll make up some answers. Yes, thank you so much, Larry and Mary. That was amazing. It's always so fun to see your career in pictures. And 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 I mean, I just am still so amazed at how much work you, you know, for all of you in the audience, Larry's a trained artist, as you can see, and he has just created such a body of work for the scientific community that is unparalleled. But um, Larry, I, now I want to get one of your, since you're into flukes, I think we need to get, as you said, since the fluke is not, does not have any bony parts, we need to get a big blue whale fluke out by the crow's nest so we can show people the scale of our 70 foot blue whale fluke that we can't show with the with the skeleton i think that's a i think that's an ambition we need to work with you on yes indeed yes indeed that would be fun yeah it'd be fun yeah we have all the information that's the hard part <laughs> no raising the money is the hard part <laughs> Now nah, we can do it. We can do it. All right. Well, I'm going to just open it up now to questions. I mean, it's a, it's, it's the floor. The floor is open. If anybody wants to ask Larry or Mary questions about this incredible amount of uh, work, please feel free. Oh, no questions, huh? <laughs> hey, Larry, what a question I have is like, you know, the, 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 the vaquita or, or some of the beaked whales that, that are still so unknown how, how did you do this was it the same process i mean did you just try to find photographs or scientists that yes you yes and, so photographs exactly. of dead ones that had come on shore that i mean we know yeah. better than anyone when they come on shore they get so manky quickly that's right that's right it's a real problem 
You know, there's, I, I haven't checked recently, but when I was doing these illustrations, there, there was uh, one species of Mazoplodon that was only known from mandibular uh, uh, sections found on a beach and a tooth. They put the whole species together from that. So how can you illustrate that? I always illustrated that animal in uh, dotted lines because I had no <laughs> idea what it was like. <laughs> but, I, but I work with some pretty good people on Mazalpadons. Alan Baker in New Zealand, he's a master at that, director of the museums, you know. Auckland. Yeah, in Auckland, yeah. National yeah. Museum of, of uh, New Zealand. You've so had some pretty happy. amazing collaborations in your career. What do you think is one of the most, one of the most rewarding for you? Who, who is the most rewarding you work with? Yeah, rewarding. Um, I guess being able to climb on my own sculpture. Because <laughs> I did that whale, the first whale sculpture, I did it because above all, I wanted to see what a real whale would look like. How would I, How am I ever going to get to see a real life, I mean, anatomically correct gray whale? So I, I did the sculpture for my own personal amusement and everybody else. And there's, there's still people climbing on it. Isn't that nice? That's amazing. Okay, yeah. I see we have a question from Donna Brownsey. Donna, excellent use of the hand hand raising. Thank you. <laughs> In fact, um, I will lower my hand now that you've called me. Uh, Larry and Mary, amazing presentation. I just loved it so much. Thank you. You mean tonight? Tonight, <laughs> absolutely. So I have. Well, thank you very much. I didn't expect. I didn't see that coming. Well. <laughs> No, I'm kidding around. I was just going to say, I don't know why, but okay. So <laughs> I have two questions. One, Larry, uh, so you were a kid in Sacramento at five years old, you drew a whale. Did that start your lifelong obsession with whales or how did you, how did you kind of stumble into that? And then I have a question for you Larry after. Mm, it's a good one. My father, was very good at explaining things. And he wanted to explain the largest animals of all time to me. I'm just a little kid. And I was totally amazed. The whales are big, huge, bigger than dinosaurs. And guess what? They don't bite. Now that just got my attention to something fierce. And animals 100 feet long, they in the water, you can jump in with them because they won't bite. So that's the beautiful thing. Uh, that intrigued your uh, that, yeah that so that that was a beautiful curiosity. thing that got me i believe that's what it was probably in my blood too because mm -hmm. my father loved animals so uh that was that's how it all started doing whale drawings when i was a kid i did some of them on the wall behind the curtains well, my mother didn't like that too much <laughs> <laughs> too bad anyway well that that's amazing okay so mary uh you obviously are a total partner in, uh, in uh, this whale uh, reality. And so how did the two of you meet? And, and Mary, what, what kind of spurs your passion here? Oh my, well, uh, I'm Larry's third wife <laughs> and we met 33 years ago, we were neighbors believe it or not. No, no, and I, I never had a wife before I met Mary. <laughs> thought I did, but I didn't. Uh, We've no, been together over 30, 40 years. Yeah, so almost 40 years. years. So anyway, uh, I, I was a musician, so I never really thought about whales ever until I met Larry and was so fascinated. And uh, through the years, you know, I she lives Surra across the street. Surrounded by whale art and all these whale sculptures. I met a lot of scientists and colleagues of his throughout the decades. We were neighbors. And, and, and uh, but um, it wasn't really until we started this book that I dig deep and just, I, I, I still am in awe of all the work one person has done in one lifetime. Um, I, his drive, before I met him, his drive in the 60s and 70s, I don't know if I would have liked him <laughs> then, because it must, it was just nonstop. Um, yeah, every day, every, every night. day, every night, he just breathed and ate whale, and I mean, just that's all he thought about. But, sleep. but it, but when we did the book, it was just so fascinating to see it all come to life and the joy of him writing about it and all, uh, all yeah, his experiences. 
So thanks for asking that. It's been very, uh, very rewarding for me and was such an education. So given that the two of you probably have thought about whales more than anybody uh, on this <laughs> Zoom, I just want to hear from both of you, what, what do you, what are your thoughts for the future, for the future of whales and for the health of our ocean? Well, I'm not, uh, prognostication is a lost art. Um, I picked that up somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I would like to see a lot more uh, whales in high places everywhere. I, uh, I announced in our book that I would like to see a whale in the White House, way up there. So that never happened. But, well, maybe it did, but no, that never happened. No. But uh, yeah, I would, I would, I'm inspired to keep on pushing and shoving uh, whales uh, all over the place. I haven't slowed down one bit. I love cetacea. Well, We're I, all for it. And I think there's institutions like the Noyo Center yeah. that, um, I mean, how, how fortunate we are to have that right here in Fort Bragg. And when we moved here, we retired here nine years ago, uh, to see it just blossom. And it's going to, it's, I just can't wait to see the next nine years, uh, the new whale center and on the, 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 uh, the lumber property or the mill property. It's going to be magnificent. Yeah, on the, and, and Larry, from the, he talked about his own little whale chart he sent to thousands of schools. Um, it, oh, education was everything to him. And I, I think the sculptures are such magnets to children and a, a, a brilliant way to teach. When you go to Lawrence Hall of Science and FINA, the kids don't want to go inside. They want to play on FINA. They want to learn all about her and uh, what is this animal? What is it doing? What? Why is it here? And uh, um, it's just like his when he had his dad tell him about the largest animal. It still fascinates children, and that's we need to start there. So I sure hope the Noyo Center gets a whale sculpture of some Thank type. You. Well, and on that vein, we have a question in the chat from Tony that was said, how hard was it to transport that full size gray whale around the country? And, and did you ever, I mean, how did you do it? How did you transport Well, we couldn't take it anywhere. We couldn't take it anywhere that didn't have a forklift. <laughs> I imagine. And I, I think it's in about eight pieces. And each piece, piece weighs a couple of thousand pounds or maybe a little less than that. It's ferro-cement. It's not real thick. It's only about uh, five-eighths of an inch thick, less than an inch thick, but it's still big and heavy. And also, I call it, I call it, I call it permanent. I call it very permanent. That's not correct. But I call, huh? Yeah, ferro-cement's very permanent. <laughs> so would you do that if we did one out on the, on the coastal trail? Would you use that same material? I was part of that. Would you use ferro cement uh, on the new uh, Noyo Center? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. It's very you durable. Can, you can make all those compound shapes, and it's very permanent and, and, and durable. Yeah. Uh, the, the fiberglass thin wheel has to be painted every th three years because the kids wear it out. But ferro cement is okay, weather. we're going to start uh, building a budget about this so I can start shopping it around. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, Please do. Please do, yeah. Sheila. Yeah. Sheila, the Pacific Grove Museum, they did that amazing community campaign. Yeah, um, I the, know. That um, was an incredible but, piece. But the thing is, they had the whale. Everybody could see it. Yeah. So uh, so people wanted to buy it, buy a pound or two or three. But uh, Larry, we do have our models. So you know they could be on display somewhere for a campaign. In front of Harvest Market, you know, raise money to build yeah. this. Yeah. Anyway, something to talk about. All yeah. right, you got the fire lit under us now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, I see you there, Doug. How about going? You go. Well, back in the old days, when we were all uh, saving the whales, the whale warriors, we called ourselves. I knew Larry pretty well, and there was Larry, J.D. Mayhew, Bird Baker, George Sumner, all of us, and this is a, I don't know if we can see it, this is a photo, it's in the lower oh. left, oh. that was a J.D. Mayhew's uh, Mendocino Wildlife Gallery, 
And I think Larry's. Oh, I think Larry's Doug yeah. Thompson. Yeah. I'll be damned. <laughs> We're still alive. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, there he is. Do you live up here? Yeah, no, we I, we don't right now, but uh, oh. we're looking to move. So I don't know. Fort Bragg and Mendocino has always had my heart. And I oh. love what you guys have done with the the center up there. It's just uh, awe inspiring. Yeah. It really is. Really fun. Oh, it's nice to see you. They have a full size blue whale um, uh, skeleton. Totally profound. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't yeah. wait to do that. Oh, nice shirt, Larry. <laughs> yeah. I, I traveled with Sandy for a while uh, down at Point Harbor and all those areas. And what what Larry was saying about the kids is really true. They you couldn't keep them off from it. And then it, it had to go somewhere else. So Dana Point Harbor was kind of my home port. So what we did is we grew a top two What do you call it? Topiary. Topiary of the whale, and it's still there today. And we have to keep wow. it maintained and all that. So. Oh, wow. Oh, we have included oh. that in the plans for our new center is to have a playground area with a whale like that. So it's 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 at least in the vision. Yay. <laughs> oh, good. So was that picture that you were showing it had Mayhew and you and other folks and Larry's in that picture too? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so he, cool. He's standing by the stovepipe. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's when his book on yeah. the Smithsonian book had just come out, and that's when we were up there having a celebration. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Is that right? How about that? That? Larry, I'll send that to you. Oh, please do. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Look at all the hair I had. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> hey, forgot about that. I didn't know you were involved in that group, Larry. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. that was uh, and for decades. I took people down to San Ignacio Lagoon with gray whales. And it's yeah. just, uh, it, it's really what it's been a wonderful thing for me uh, working around whales and all that. But anyway, thank you guys for doing this. I saw that pop up uh, that you were going to be there, Larry. And I just, I told my wife, Robin, I said, God, we got to watch that. We just got it. So yeah, anyway. that's great. we're glad you joined us. Thank you both. So I see our intrepid educator, Sue Magoo, has a question for you, Larry. I just wanted to let you know, Larry, I'm um, the fortunate one that gets to go into the classroom and talk to the kids about the whales. And I was at Montessori Del Mar today with the kindergartners talking about yeah. mammals, marine mammals, how big they are, all that. And mm -hmm. I had them, I told them about how humpbacks are identifiable by their tails, like we are by our fingerprints. So they all made their own design of a whale tail. So I just thought, you know, Beautiful. that tradition's carrying on. They might have not, they might not make quite the whales that you do, but there's about 19 different wild looking whale tails that are gonna be hanging up in their classroom. Tell <laughs> so. them about the, about the thumbprints. Yeah, so it was funny because they were so fascinated by the thumbprint idea. So then they decorated, you know, how the humpbacks have like some, they have like little bits of black and white. So they used their thumbprints to decorate their the flukes. <laughs> uh -huh. She said it was like their thumbprint because can, they can identify them from the flukes. And so the Excellent. kids just jumped on decorating. Well, I thought, I'd let you know that it's still going on this many decades later. Some kindergartners' appetites are getting wet. So thank you so much for all an incredible presentation. And I really want to see us make one of those whales happen out at our property because I just, I've just seen that one photo of the man with the kids. I was like, oh my God, we could bring the school kids out there and have them lay down. And how many kids it does it take to get next to our blue whale kind of a thing. So yeah. thank you for being an incredible inspiration and um, pursuing, pr like creating pr like realistic images of whales. And I just really appreciated the way that you tied it into the fact that most of the imagery was always about them being dead. So thank you for making them alive and colorful and pretty. And then my only other question is with those latest pictures that you've made, any chance you'd think about turning them into cards and we could sell them at our discovery center? Just oh. saying, wink, wink. <laughs> and Sue, if you need any uh, help, uh, additional educational materials like the handout whale chart, kids can color in the, the sh different shapes. This let us know. Okay, yeah, that would be fabulous. I have that in my binder because I teach yeah. at Point Cabrillo as well and it's in my binder. So that yeah. was really cool to yeah. make the connection that you're the person that created that. So Yeah, and, and also we have felt pins too. <laughs> okay, cool. Excellent. I'll definitely be talking to you then. Thank you. All right. Any other questions before we call it a night and let Larry go drink some more seawater? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll do a flute painting. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting some. You're getting some thank yous in the chart in the chat, Larry. Oh, thank you so much, and Mary, both of you, for not you. only what spending the evening with us, but for all the work you've put into this over the years. It's well, thank you. 
Yeah. Quite a pleasure. It's an honor to be with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we look forward to many more conversations. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, good. Okay. Thank okay, you. Everybody. And I just want to uh, remind everybody that we try to put these things on for free, but if you have the ability to, to donate, please do. Noyocenter.org slash donate. Um, help support our education program and all the things. Okay, I will. Sue's doing with the kids. Not you, Larry. Oh. <laughs>